Hi, my name is Joe McCartan, and I'm the executive director of the Kalmanovitz Initiative for Labor and the Working Poor at Georgetown University. On behalf of the Kalmanovitz Initiative, I'd like to welcome you to this multi-day convening, Constructing a New Social Compact, a public forum on empowering the post-pandemic working class. And I'd like to welcome you to this, our opening plenary panel, The Future of Workers and Democracy. We hope you'll join us for a number of sessions across the next several days. We are recording today's session. Um, there will be Spanish language interpretation um, and we can put up a slide now explaining how that will occur. Um, you can also press uh, uh, live transcript CC at the bottom of the um, screen if you'd like to have a live transcript of um, the, the, the session as it's ongoing. Suscríbete o con la tableta, es similar, busquen un botoncito que dice más o more, si lo tienen en inglés, tiene tres puntos. De ahí, eh, eligen el menú interpretación de idiomas, después su idioma y después finalizar. Por favor, tengan en cuenta que tienen que tener un teléfono o tableta con Android o de Apple, y si es computadora, tiene que ser Windows o tiene que ser Mac. Eh, los otros no funcionan. Gracias. Gracias. So, um, translation is available as you hear. We also will have a live transcript that's available by pressing CC. Um, before I begin, uh, I want to thank those who have made this event possible. First, I'd like to thank the members of our organizing committee. It included 41 people from more than two dozen. Uh, organizations, including unions, educational institutions, think tanks, activist organizations, and coalitions. You can find their names on our conference website, and we'll drop a link into the chat right now so you can see that list in full. Special thanks to one member of that um, planning committee, Knut Pankman, and his colleagues at the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, who have helped us finance this gathering. And big, big thanks to my Kalmanovitz Initiative colleagues, especially Lane Windham, our associate director who led our planning committee's work, and Lily Ryan, who's handled all of the logistics that makes it possible for us to be together today. As we gather today, we stand at what I think we can agree is an important historical inflection point. Today, as many of you know, we mark Workers' Memorial Day in the United States. Even as we struggle to emerge from a pandemic that has caused death to over half a million Americans and more than three million worldwide. A pandemic that has hit working people and people of color with disproportionate ferocity and which, as we see in the recent news from India, for example, continues to ravage the world. We also stand at an important inflection point uh, here in the United States as the Biden administration re nears its 100th day in office. Spanning the Biden administration's 100th day mark and concluding on May 1st, the International Workers' Holiday, May Day, this gathering's purpose is to outline the big work that still lies ahead in the effort to build a just, sustainable, and democratic future in which the needs and concerns of working people are central. And that brings us to today's panel and to the subject we want to engage, the future of workers and democracy. Recent events, the pandemic, 
the unequal pain it has inflicted, the persistence of deep structural inequalities around race and gender, which recent events have really underlined for us have emphasized our need for a new social compact in the 21st century, one that encompasses those um, who were left out by the New Deal's social compact and one that redresses structural inequities. In our view, that new social compact has to answer the dual crisis we now face, a crisis of insecurity and inequality and lack of rights for workers on the one hand, and a crisis of democracy over who has the right to vote and what it is possible for democracy to do on the other hand. With that in mind, we've assembled three amazing leaders to help us recognize where we stand in this moment and what must be done to create the kind of future we need. Let me briefly introduce them. First, Sarita Gupta is the director of the Ford Foundation's Future of Workers program, leading the team that oversees Ford's efforts to actively shape a future of work that puts workers and their well-being at the center. She joined Ford after working for more than 20 years to expand people's ability to come together to improve their workplaces, their communities and their lives by creating solutions to the problems they face. She has deep expertise in policy advocacy, organizing and building partnerships across the workers' rights and care movements, having served as executive director of Jobs with Justice and co-director of Caring Across Generations. She is nationally recognized as an expert on economic, labor, and political issues affecting working people and is widely acknowledged as a key leader and a strategist in the progressive movement. Chris Liu is the Teresa A. Sullivan Practitioner Senior Fellow at the Miller Center at the University of Virginia. At least he was as of yesterday. Uh, he won't be in that position for long, if indeed he has not already resigned it for just yesterday. President Joe Biden nominated Chris to become representative to the United Nations for management and reform with the rank of ambassador in the U.S. Department of State. It's easy to see why President Biden turned to Chris. He has more than 20 years of experience in government. He's worked in all three branches of the federal government. He served as executive director of the Biden, uh, of the Obama Biden transition project, and he went on to serve as deputy secretary of labor in the Obama administration. His knowledge of the interface between labor and public policy makes him one of our most valuable voices on this subject, and we couldn't be happier uh, than to think he'll be bringing that worldview to his work at the United Nations. And finally, we have Sharon Burrow who is General Secretary of the International Trade Union Confederation, a position she has held since 2010. Prior to that, Sharon held the position of uh, President of the ITUC since its founding conference in Vienna in 2006. And before that, she was President of a predecessor organization, the International Confederation of Free Trade Unions. She is the first woman to have held any of these positions and for almost two decades then, she's been a leader of the worldwide union movement. Sharon is a native of Australia, and she's a teacher by training, having been involved in the union movement by joining the New South Wales Teachers Federation. So in Sarita, Chris, and Sharon, we have three complementary sets of experience and worldview to bring to bear on this dual crisis of democracy and of, of the future of workers. And so let's begin the discussion. I'd like to start with, with Sarita. Sarita, in just the last month, we've seen two ominous developments. Amazon's success in derailing a union campaign in Bessemer, Alabama, and efforts in more than 30 states to restrict eligible voters' access to the ballot. Uh, how do these developments help us grasp the nature of the challenges we face in this moment? 
Well, first off, I want to take this opportunity to thank you, Joe, and your colleagues for organizing such a timely and important conversation about the new social compact. And I'm just thrilled to be in this conversation with my fellow panelists, Chris and Sharon. So to your question, these two developments, Amazon's success in derailing a union campaign and the voter suppression efforts launched in more than 30 states, are attempts to solidify mass inequality in the economic arena and minority rule in the political arena. Basically, if you cannot win because a majority of people will not support what you want, then you rig the game, which is what workers and those fighting voter suppression are confronting. We are playing on someone else's game board. This does not mean we do not have wins sometimes, but it is a lot harder to win in this context. For those who are working to suppress civil and voting rights, it's apparently not enough that the Electoral College has permitted a minority of voters to select who our president is. It is important to note that of the last seven elections, the Republican candidate has won the popular vote only once. And yet they have appointed six of the nine current Supreme Court justices packing the court with judges who support their causes and ideologies. And if that is not enough, those opposed to the idea of a multiracial democracy are advancing gerrymandering efforts in states to draw maps in ways that promote minority rule in order to keep power. And all of these efforts will get further fueled by the recent census results. All of this is extremely undemocratic. And even when our opponents lose in the elections, opponents of multiracial democracy will take actions to try to hold on to power. As we've seen, everything from storming the Capitol to not recognizing President Biden's victory, even though he won by 7 million votes. And so we see the growing attacks on the right to vote. Technically, every citizen has the right to register to vote and actually vote, yet we're witnessing uh, the many, many obstacles to, that are making it difficult to do either. And this is exactly what's been happening for 40 years in workplaces. The game has been rigged for workers trying to organize a union and collectively bargain. In recent polls, we have found that two thirds of Americans, if given the opportunity to form a union, want to form a union. Yet we only have 10 to 11% of the workforce in unions. Why? Well, again, the game is rigged. Uh, if you can imagine in any workplace, let's say 65% of workers sign cards that say they want a union to represent them in bargaining, by the time the employer has finished their anti-union campaign in the workplace, workers will have lost the union election by 15 to 20%. And this is what we saw happen at Amazon. There were many issues that galvanized workers in Bessemer, majority of whom are African-Americans. Uh, and I think we've all been reading the story, so I won't go into depth on what the issues are, um, but RWDSU, the union filed an election after collecting 3,000 cards, they had a majority of the workers supporting the idea of a union, and then Amazon unleashed a strong pushback with lengthy mandatory information sessions and flurries of text messages to its workers. There were slogans put all over the, the, fact, the uh, distribution center, do it without dues, and so much more. And by the end of the anti-union campaign, Amazon was successful. They were successful in instilling fear. So just to wrap, I just want to say work is a place where freedom of speech, assembly, or association are relentlessly curved, where people are subject to surveillance of their movements and communications by new technologies, where non-compete agreements signed as a condition of employment curtail the right of workers to leave their jobs to seek better ones, thereby weakening their bargaining power, and where arbitration clauses strip them of their right to legal recourse when they have suffered discrimination, harassment, health, or safety violations. So both worker bargaining power and political democracy have been gripped by a mutually reinforcing crisis that has worsened for decades, harming people, uh, working people, especially communities of color, and undermining our social fabric. And so as a result, 
we are experiencing exploding wealth and income inequality, resurgent monopoly, judicial attacks on unions, the rise of white supremacy, voter suppression and state violence targeted at communities of color. And these all demonstrate the crises of politics and of worker organization. And frankly, they, it clarifies the relation between the two. Therefore, it will be critical for us to link the defense of political democracy to the fight for bargaining power for workers in the 21st century economy. And we're already seeing amazing examples of this work taking root, which I'm sure participants and attendees will hear about in the rest of the conference and we can get into more detail on in conversation if needed or wanted. A wonderful opening. Thank you uh, for putting those things on, on the agenda, Sarita. We'll come back to talk more about some of that even before we're done, some of those examples you were alluding to. Um, you, Sarita has just uh, talked about the, the, the deep political polarization in this moment, which is behind a lot of um, the struggles that she's outlined. And what's Turn to Chris Liu, because um, Chris, you were um, serving um, at, at this point in the Obama administration, um, in which you could say that we were getting a preview of this kind of resistance back then. You served uh, in President uh, Obama's Labor Department as he was struggling to, to meet the challenge of the Great Recession. And we, we saw a lot of the kind of um, that uh, Sarita just alluded to then. What similarities and differences do you see between the challenge that Joe Biden faces today and those that President Obama faced um, when you were with him back then? What have we learned um, since then? And what do we need uh, to do to, to achieve progress in this moment? Thank you, Joe, so much for having me and for putting on this remarkable conference. You know, I think back to, um, January of 2009, when I was uh, managing President Obama's cabinet, uh, the very first jobs report we had, we lost 800,000 jobs, which was an unthinkable amount of jobs back in that time. We have now lost multiple times that during this current economic downturn. So in a sense, the, the crisis we are facing now is of multiple magnitudes worse than what we faced back in 2009. Um, it, but it's a different kind of uh, downturn. Uh, that was one that was caused by a financial crisis, a housing crisis. There were systemic issues that underlied all of that. Uh, we were able back in 2009 to pass an $800 billion recovery act, which made meaningful impact in terms of creating jobs um, and jumpstarting some of the clean energy work that President Biden is building on now. But that was it, $800 billion. And again, at the time, an unthinkable amount of money. Uh, just simply over the past year, We've already put out between four and five trillion dollars, trillion, which was a, a, a word that we weren't going to come close to talking about back in 2009. And it's one of the reasons why you have seen the economy bounce back much faster. That being said, in those intervening 12 years, while we tried to recover from the Great Recession, we saw the continuation of long-term trends where to the extent the economy recovered, it recovered for people at the top. Wages stagnated or continued their long-term stagnation for people at the bottom. Um, as Sarita pointed out, labor protections continued to be eroded along the way. Uh, obviously with globalization, automation, a lot of longer-term trends, um, a lot of the underlying safety net protections for workers uh, disappeared as well. Layer on top of that, um, the increase in people working gig jobs. So uh, the short answer to your question is there are many aspects of the current economic crisis that were similar in 2009, but the entire structure of how our economy works has worsened for employees. And it's frankly one of the reasons why President Biden talks about Build, build Back Better. This isn't just about bringing our economy back to where it was pre-recession. It's about dealing with some of these systemic inequalities. The fact that even after the passage of the Affordable Care Act, we still have tens of millions of people without health insurance, that we have a rickety unemployment insurance system such that when people are out of work, 
Um, they're literally filling out paper copies of applications that, you know, we've got this, uh, we've got a minimum wage in this country that has not been raised since 2009, the longest time in our country's history. Um, and we continue to have broad inequalities when it comes to uh, people of different races. It doesn't matter if the economy is good or it is bad. The black unemployment rate in this country is always twice as high as it is for whites in this country. So build back better means dealing with some of these systemic inequalities and frankly, trying to create greater innovation in this country and trying to you know, fix not just the roads and bridges, which we all acknowledge need to be fixed, but try to fix what we call the human infrastructure, making it more possible for people to go to work, to take care of their lives, to balance their home and work. And in addition to this remarkable $2 trillion uh, physical infrastructure plan that the president has put out, what he has done today in putting out the American Families Plan of almost $2 trillion is extraordinary. And I wanna talk more about that later, but in simply recognizing that a worker being a, unable to go to work because he or she does not have childcare or has a, a, a disabled child or has a, an elderly parent at home and has caregiving needs, that person not being able to go to work because of those needs is like that person not being able to go to work because the roads have potholes in them or that person does not have mass transit. And that's such an important recognition uh, and that's why I'm so excited about what the president is putting out today. Thank you, Chris, uh, for that. And it, we, we should come back to the American Families Plan, which we learned details of this morning before we're done with this. Thank you for putting that on the table. Um, let's turn to Sharon now. Um, Sharon, um, Sarita and Chris have spoken to the American context of this moment and they have helped outline what's happening here. You represent an international confederation of unions. Uh, the IUT, ITUC, if, if um, some listeners don't um, know much about it, represents more than 2 million workers around the world through its 331 affiliated organizations. So you're operating with, with a network that's active in 163 countries and territories, Sharon. How does what is happening here in the US um, compare with what you're seeing elsewhere in the world? And how do you see the challenge for the worldwide labor movement uh, at this moment? Well, thank you, Joe. And indeed, um, if you look at the global framework of what both Sarita and Chris have described in the US, then let's start with democracy because you very cleverly align democracy and indeed workers' rights and, and decent work as being in, entwined, and they absolutely are. If, if you think about a world where we've got less than 50% of people who live in democracies, that's a start, less than 50%, historic low in terms of the last 30 years. And then you actually consider that around 45% of young people globally have never seen a, a democracy dividend. So they've never seen, even in democracies, the kind of security of work, the opportunities, they're riddled with debt for higher education, their jobs are so low paid at the uh, other end of the low skill spectrum that indeed they feel, you know, quite a lot of despair and that brings with it anger. Particularly when you see that you've got uh, a world where in the last 30 to 40 years, depending on which benchmark you choose, four to seven times wealthier in GDP terms, but the labor income share has been like a roller coaster going downwards. So those kind of um, job statistics that Chris talked about, of course, in terms of crisis, yes, we can map that around the world, but what has never happened after each successive uh, bubble or crisis is unemployment come back to anywhere near full employment. And with a labor income share, basically meaning that people on uh, minimum wages or without collective agreements, uh, struggle to actually make ends meet or working two or three jobs. That's, we're talking about the formal sector. 
where of the 40% of a broken labour market globally, 40% uh, only have actually uh, got employment opportunities in, in the so-called informal sec uh, formal sector, where employers take some responsibility for their workforce, where there are some rights. However, up to a third globally and more increasingly are living even within those formal jobs on insecure or precarious uh, work. And of course, most of them low paid and the majority of low paid are women or indeed migrant workers or workers of color. So when you think about that and then say, well, what about the other 60%? Well, that's the global scandal of an unjust framework for development, of the lack of democracy, and indeed of the wealth that's simply been generated for the 1% and most of that wealth in developed economies. Because 60% of workers across both developed and developing economies are working in the informal economy. There's no rights, no minimum wage, no rule of law, and they struggle to survive every day. Now, the bridge, of course, that we would think should be in the formal economy is not with the growing and emerging business models of platform business. They're actually informal work. So we have a broken labour market. And of course, if you want to build progressive uh, government on a broken uh, 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 labour market, then we have to ask hard questions. What have progressive parties been doing about putting people at the centre of the economy. Care and concern for people, of course, would be fantastic, but even putting them at the centre of the economy, given that we're basing an economic future still on a consumption and more often than not on an export-driven model. So in that context, when you link the collapse of um, the employment uh, uh, model globally, and you link it to the demise of democracy or trust in democracy and the numbers of uh, people living in democracies, then it's not hard to see the, uh, the, the uh, relationship. I would say before COVID-19, of course, these uh, the convergence of, of the crisis in terms of historic levels of inequality and, uh, and indeed the um, and, and indeed the climate emergency was already creating an environment with a broken labour market that just was absolutely ripe territory for authoritarianism or far-right politics. Mm -hmm. Because if people have seen jobs destroyed, livelihoods destroyed, and we could go through the waves of job and livelihood destructions, but I, I won't do that for the minute, just assume that's there, whether it's been technology or whether it's been... Um, uh, uh, technology or whether it's been uh, indeed globalisation that's distorted jobs, created dehumanising supply chains, or whether it's indeed just the demise of income and job security. But it's a haven for those people who actually want to promise the world, promise heaven to workers who are struggling in despair, feel anger about the lack of opportunity for themselves and their children, and they promise them everything. Of course, we know it's false promises. We know it's based on too often on white supremacy, certainly not inclusion, and certainly not an, an inclusive model. So what do we need? We need a new social contract and we need it to be jobs, jobs and jobs, climate friendly jobs. We need rights. So the dignity of workers enshrined and I'm so excited to see both the PRO Act, keep your fingers crossed, the world is, I think. And of course, uh, the, uh, um, the, the collective bargaining uh, or the organising, I should say, um, uh, program that just put together by uh, President Biden. So exciting. However, we also need to recognise that rights have to be there for everybody, not just those in the formal employment sector. And the Arlo Centenary Declaration points to that. But we need universal social protection not a term that uh, um, Americans readily um, recognise because the model's very different mm -hmm. in other countries for inclusive health care, for unemployment support, for all those areas of social protection that are safety nets, in, including income support if people need it. 
And we need, of course, equality, income, racial, gender equality. If we don't actually um, have these things, you can't have a just development model, nor can you have meet the test of the SDGs or the climate challenge. And of course, you won't rebuild progressive democracies. And so there you have it, really. The final thing I'd say is that the corporate model that, that actually so stacks um, uh, the laws or the practice of the laws against workers in the US has actually generated a global competition. You've had the American corporate model with its anti-union, anti anti-worker mm -hmm. approach. Amazon's not just in the US, but indeed uh, against the European social model for want of a better description, where indeed you do have entrenched dialogue, works councils, an inclusion of workers' voice. Now it's not perfect, but at least it is not the, uh, the anti-worker framework that workers are struggling against and unions are struggling against in the US, despite the fact that all the research shows that the unions indeed built your middle class and the economies. And I'm so glad to see a president who's recognizing that. So a new social compact contract dealing with those convergence of crisis, including the health crisis, is the only answer if we want to rebuild trust in and strength of democracy. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, well, well framed for us. And I want to remind uh, our audience that you can submit questions to our panelists using the Q&A function. Um, and thank you, uh, Sharon, for mentioning the PRO Act, the Protect the Right to Organize Act, which is currently um, before the Congress. Um, and this week, there is a lot going on to try to advance the PRO Act, a, a week of action. And we'll talk about the PRO Act more in a plenary tonight. But it's good to have on the table in this discussion. I want to circle back to, to you, Sarita. Um, as you've heard Chris and um, Sharon speak, I'm sure you have some thoughts about what you've heard from them. I'd also just like to invite you to speak to what you've heard, but uh, um, maybe also do that in the context of, um, I, I know a lot of deep thinking you've been doing about these questions, and I've had the uh, pleasure of having a sneak preview of a book that you have written with your longtime collaborator, Erica Smiley, in which you engage what we, what the nature of this struggle is in this moment. And, and maybe, you know, you could talk a little bit about the vision that informs that book as you respond to anything you care to from Chris or, or Sharon. Sure. No, there's, um, so much resonance with what both Chris and Sharon have put out. Um, I think it does give us a very holistic picture of many of the challenges of the moment we're in um, and what that calls for us to do moving forward. I mean, I would say, you know, despite these challenges, there are these incredible kernels of hope. And Joe, to your point, some of um, a little bit about the book that Erica Smiley and I have authored and we hope will get published soon um, is really lifting up some of the new models and different models and approaches that workers are taking to organize um, and really expanding the very limited notion that we have in the United States about what collective bargaining rights is um, and really blowing that open to say, all working people should be able to bargain or negotiate with any entity that has decision-making over their lives. So it's not just in the workplace context, it's important to think about it in the broader community context. So we see you know, housing, um, amazing uh, unions forming um, amongst renters, we see workplace organizing happening, and we're seeing organizing of workers that people have long thought it was impossible to organize. I mean, part of what's so exciting to me um, is looking, if you look at care workers and the care workforce and particularly domestic worker organizing that's happening that has taken root so many years ago, right? 20, 20 plus years ago, but 20 years ago, like a real concerted effort. These were workers who've been excluded from the Fair Labor Standard Act, excluded from the right to organize and collectively bargain. And here we are today, not only in states are we seeing the great work of the National Domestic Workers Alliance 
Prince and others organizing bills of rights that are setting up these models for bargaining that are bringing the state together with the industry, with the workers to begin to really um, address a wide range of um, wages and working conditions. Um, but now we see an actual conversation in the American Family Plan about care and the care economy and making the link to care as an important part of our infrastructure. I mean, that is, it, those are leaps forward in this moment. And we're talking about a majority women of color and immigrant women workforce. So this is pretty remarkable to see um, openings like that. And then, and then just to connect it to Sharon's point about global social protections, like domestic workers aren't just organizing in the US, they're, they're organizing globally. They have an ILO convention. Um, and on top of it, have been really important advocates around the world around why we need to broaden and expand global social protections. So it's just one minor, like, narrow example, but it is, I, I share it because I think it speaks to the openings and the moment that we have um, to actually, this is not a moment for tinkering around with reforms. It actually is about what are the leaps forward that we can make given the scale and scope of the crisis that we're in. Um, and I think there's just so much opportunity on that front. And I'm, I would love for Sharon to talk a little bit more um, about the, that intersection when I think about climate and labor. There's so many openings there um, that I'll let her speak to because she's been um, really tracking and leading on that, those efforts. But I think there's real, the point here is that there's real opportunities. I also just want to say that in addition to using the CARE example, we see other organizing efforts across the country. Bargaining for the common good has been really exciting to see public sector unions, private sector unions, unions, you know, parents, community members coming together and really bargaining, like really utilizing the bargaining power of existing unions to demand that we bargain for more than what the law says we can bargain over again, that we're expanding the issues and the topics that, that we believe are up for negotiation for not only workers, but workers as community members as well. Um, and so I'll just close by saying, we're seeing so many efforts like that, where it is about a holistic view of workers. Often we say sort of civil rights is over here and workers are over here as if like, and it's so counter to people's lived experiences. So this idea of centering lived experiences of work workers and then understanding how these issues truly play off each other and should be aligned, I think is where the promise is for the kind of democracy that um, we're striving for. Thank you so much, Sarita, and for mentioning bargaining for the common good, which we'll talk about um, in several other sessions over the course of the next few days, which I agree is one of the most exciting examples of trying to put together the fight for democracy, broadly speaking, and, and you know, worker empowerment. Chris, you um, raised the, the issue of the American Families Plan um, in your uh, opening comments, and Sarita just spoke to that a bit. Um, I wonder if you could say a few more words about what you think is important about that. And I think, you know, you have a kind of unique experience, it seems to me, Chris, and in, in that your experience in government policymaking is broad. It's not just confined to labor. And so you, you have, I think, a special appreciation, it would seem to me, of what Sarita was just saying about the, the whole worker. And so how do you see um, the family's plan fitting into that? And, and why is this such an important um, thing for the moment? It's a great question, and Joe. And let's just kind of go back to when most of uh, the labor laws in the United States were created, which is in the late 1930s during the New Deal. And the nature of work at that time was somebody went to a physical office from nine to five, Monday to Friday, got their health care, got a pension there, um, had some measure of uh, protection in their job. Uh, I should say this was largely a white male uh, with a family and a caretaker at home watching children. Uh, and that person would work there 40 years and have a comfortable enough 
uh, life that they could buy a home, um, send their kids to college and, 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 and retire. That's not the workforce of now by any stretch of the imagination. And we don't have labor laws that reflect both the changing nature of work, nor do we have uh, the sufficient social protections. Now, I don't wanna say we have no social protections. Obviously in their intervening period of time, we've layered on Medicare, Medicaid, obviously the Affordable Care Act is a huge um, uh, 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 protection. But as work has changed, we have not made it possible or we have not facilitated both the entry of people into the workforce as well as the advancement of people into the workforce. Even if you simply fast forward to the 1950s and 1960s, there was a period of time in this country where you could graduate from high school and get a good paying union job and still have that comfortable lifestyle. That's not the economy of the United States today. So what the American Families Plan tries to do is both understand what are the needs of workers in the 21st century, not only in terms of gaining the skills that they need, but in providing the protection and helping to facilitate them in, 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 in maximizing their work potential. So what it does is understanding that the United States really is far behind in terms of universal pre-K education. It's really far behind in terms of free community college. And simply in adding two years of universal pre-K, two years of community college, you've now added four years of education, free education for every worker, which allows them to better maximize their potential in the workforce. For other people, it's lowering uh, college costs as well. But understanding just having the, the education and skills is not enough. It's the home health healthcare piece that was in the first infrastructure piece, bill, 400 billion, then layering on top childcare assistance uh, in this bill, and then finally layering on top paid family leave, where again, we say this over and over again, the United States is, I think, one of two or three countries in the world without a national paid family leave policy. Um, so that allows the worker to bring all of him or herself into the workplace. And then it's dealing with a lot of things like nutritional assistance, maternal health, again, where the United States is unfortunately behind uh, where the rest of the world is. And so it's a bold plan. Um, unquestionably, this is expensive, but understand this. Um, we have far too many people um, who are not part of this labor force right now. Labor force participation has dropped precipitously in the United States over the past several decades. Um, and particularly among people of color, particularly among women. You know, I think in the 1980s, the United States and Canada had the exact same labor participation force among men and women. Uh, the United States, I think, is now five to 10 percentage points lower among women. And, and it's again, it's one of the disparities we have seen during the pandemic where women have had to withdraw from the labor force in order to balance um, the caretaking and the schooling needs of their children. And obviously we have seen people of color being the hardest hit uh, as a result of this pandemic. And so I think this is remarkably ambitious. It's where our country needs to be. I'm enough of a political realist to understand why this is so hard to do. Uh, but I give President Biden a lot of credit for putting this out there because um, this is really the blueprint for where the United States should be moving forward. Thanks, Chris. Um, and Sharon, you mentioned uh, the concept of universal social protection, which has never fared well in the United States, uh, as you alluded to. But yet, we're taking, seems to me, a pretty um, long step in that direction with the CARES Act. And maybe you want to speak to that. But before I turn to you on that, um, I wanted to, to say that um, one of the challenges, it seems to me, that besets the whole effort to, to create and sustain universal social protection is the movement of people uh, around the world. And, and we're living through a, a, an epic of unprecedented migrations of workers and refugees. Uh, and this is being you know, complicated, of course, by the climate crisis. Um, and it seems to me, certainly in the United States, that's created a really polarizing debate here about immigration. Um, but I suspect you're finding that in, in many of the nations in which you're, you're um, operating. And, and I wonder, uh, you know, how, how, we, how you see this problem and how do we navigate our way through building uh, social protections that 
work in an age of, of mass migrations, which probably are not going to end soon. Do you have a sense of that? You're muted, Sharon. You're muted. Yep. So migration is here to stay. It'll fluctuate, of course, according to demand in terms of work-related migration. Refugees are going to continue to increase. We've got increasing conflict. If you looked at the CIPRI figures this week, the massive amount of expenditure on military and arms when we so desperately need that money for schools and hospitals and support for working families is astonishing. But also climate related. I mean, so far we've had maybe uh, in, the, in the tens of thousands of refugees or people fleeing internally or externally for climate. But if you think about nightmares that I uh, often think about in my own region, the Asia Pacific, in Bangladesh, there's less than 30 million people living now, less than half a metre above uh, sea level. And if you go to Vietnam and Laos and the low lying countries, and that's without expanding, then we actually get very excited around the world, sadly, in fact, uh, in a scandalous way in terms of exclusion and xenophobia and racism against migration today. So imagine what it's going to be like when we have to deal with those levels of migration. But the good news is, if I might, uh, Joe, that um, Sarita actually touched on it. If we're going to deal with the climate crisis and if we say it's time to get a policy that returns to full employment, then, you know, to give you the figures that I'll technically release on May 1, May Day around the world, but nevertheless, um, we have uh, looked at how if you're going to achieve SDG 8 and return to the ambition of full employment that underwrites uh, the, the ILO were constitution, declaration, uh, social justice standard, pick an issue. And, uh, and indeed, then we would have to have 575 million jobs by 2030 in the formal economy, in the formal economy. And that's, that's based on a 75% participation rate, which is pretty close to full employment. The US, the EU's just raised theirs to 78 or 79, uh, but we're sticking with the 75 because that's pretty universal. But of course, a higher percentage of that gap would have to go to women to indeed, uh, you know, a range of uh, um, uh, people of different races. And we would have to look at what are the conditions to include migrant workers. The good news is if we have to deal with and we do with the climate emergency, then every sector has to transition. It's not just fossil fuels, it's every sector to get to net zero. But we can win not just the, the climate, the race against climate destruction, but win the, the war on jobs as well. Because we actually have, um, we know that for every renewable, well, 10 renewable energy jobs, there's five to 10 jobs in uh, the supply chains. There's three times that if they're good, decent jobs with good wages bargained for, with minimum living wages, then you can actually count on up to, to three times that number of jobs in the broader economy. And then there's care, and Sarita raised it. We can't have a future that is resilient without actually building livable and caring communities. We're talking about investing in livable cities that are climate, uh, that are emissions neutral. Well, those cities and all other communities, if we invest in care, you get actually twice as many jobs. We'd like it to be a bit fewer because we'd like to raise wages and conditions for care workers, but you actually get in health, childcare, aged care, education, you get double the number of jobs you'll get from jobs in, in renewable energy or uh, um, infrastructure, transport. So we can do it. It's just a matter of will. And finally, on the informal economy, if we really want to rebuild secure labour markets for everybody, then we have to look at a target of at least formalising half of those 2 billion informal jobs. So that's a billion workers, taking them out of the day-to-day -day struggle for survival and giving them social protection, which, by the way, is an ILO standard, and indeed uh, minimum living wages. It's not hard to do, it's a matter of political will. 
Thank you, Sharon. So questions are coming in now in the Q&A, and let me share um, some with you. First, I'll start with a question from uh, Laura Flanders. Uh, she, she asks, and I think this could go to any of you, uh, can you talk more about what it would mean to, as Sharon puts it, put people at the center of the economy? And do you see examples? Um, anybody want to take a shot at that? Well, let me let me give you a perspective um, that might be seem off from this convening. Um, I sit on um, the board of the American Sustainable Business Council. It represents two hundred fifty thousand uh, left leaning businesses that understand that what all businesses should understand, which is their most important investment, their most important uh, commodity, is their workers. And, and, and creating a workplace where people are paid well, where they get benefits, where they're doing meaningful work, makes it easier to recruit and retain workers. It's great for business. And so, uh, yes, we often talk about this dichotomy between labor and business. And, and to be fair, um, I'm not trying to gloss over that. I do increasingly see a recognition, and I think this goes to some of the other questions in terms of the environment as well, uh, an understanding that the role of a company is not just to enhance their shareholder value and that they have an obligation to all of their stakeholders. And by stakeholders, we mean workers as well as the environment. And specifically now I'm referencing a statement that Business Roundtable put out in August of 2019. That being said, my concern slash skepticism is that this broader commitment often plays out differently when we're talking about the environment than versus labor. And in, in, in some ways it, it's probably, I'm not gonna say it's easily, it's easier to be a sustainable company than it is to be a pro worker company. But I am heartened that some companies are understanding the importance of this. And you know, you've increasingly seen in the United States companies stepping up and when it comes to racial justice issues as we saw last year. Um, increasingly, although sometimes a little too late, when it comes to voter suppression laws as well. Um, so I think there is that understanding, but I do think it's incumbent upon shareholders to make those demands of companies. Uh, and, and I do think as importantly, to the extent you're faced dealing with a public facing company for consumers to make those demands as well, because you can vote with how you spend your money. Thank you, Chris. Um, and let me throw it in another Can I just question. say, Chris, I want to know those 250,000 businesses because, you know, they're the people we have to have this, the dialogue with, the unions have to dialogue with. And I don't, it, it's probably not well known in the States, but we work with a number of businesses internationally who you would put in that category, the B4IG group in Europe, looking at uh, how they commit to minimum wages right throughout their supply chains, led by Unilever and about 10 others, um, looking at absolute support for mandated due diligence. The B team, of course, which has three principles. One is net zero, the second is human rights, and the third is anti-corruption. And so what I see, though, is sadly that those business leaders who are, if you like, in the new terminology, leaders in a stakeholder frame of business are absolutely being challenged by the traditional, you know, shareholder primacy. And we've seen, we've lost three or four terrific CEOs who actually work with unions on all of those issues. So, you know, we need to build that bigger business community that sees beyond their own uh, relationships with workers and understands that workers have to have power of collective voice, but in the in the bargaining process, can actually bargain to help them promote some of these uh, strategies, which we all concur have to be part of the future. So let's uh, before you go to the uh, UN, let's see if we can't have a dialogue with some of those businesses. But I will also let me just respond, Sharon. I, mean, I, I won't make too much of a shameless plug for too many of these businesses, but think about companies like Patagonia, Ben and Jerry, New Belgium Brewery. Um, look, if you're a shareholder in companies, you can vote through your shares, although that's challenging because many of us don't have that number of shares. 
But as a consumer, you can make a choice where you spend your dollars. And when you send your money or you spend your money at a sustainable business, you're put placing your bet on pro-environment, pro-labor business practices. We just frankly need more uh, publicity as to what those companies actually are. Yeah, totally agree. And I won't labor this, Joe, but it's really important to say this. I was quite shocked because I've been quite a promoter of the B Corp group to find that their labor advisory was actually no better really than one the American Chamber of Commerce might uh, in, indeed write against around the fact that, you know, there's no consensus about freedom of association and what it means for workers. However, to their credit, when I raised it with them, with a few of those supportive businesses you just named, they're going to rewrite it and we're now putting people in, in place to help them do that. So, you know, wherever you see an opening for people like Sarita, myself, I know Kathy Feingold's listening from the AFL, you know, let's put that in place because Kathy's also a deputy president of ours globally. So she brings that American and global perspective. Thank you, Sharon. And Sarita, I'm sure you have thoughts to, to bring to bear on this too, but let me throw in another question that maybe you could include in your, in your own thoughts. And this is from Jada Forbes, who asks, uh, what place do freelancers have in today's fight for workers' rights and unionization, given that major companies such as Amazon, Uber, and pharmaceutical companies use independent contractors in order to get around workers' rights? its laws. So that's certainly one way that some of these companies are talking about stakeholder capitalism, but not necessarily practicing it. Yeah, it's such a great question. Um, and so complicated. I don't know that I have more to add to what Sharon and Chris have already said about the prior question. Mm -hmm. I think there's mm -hmm. opportunities and we have to maximize where those openings are um, in the business sector. And then I would just say to this question about independent contractors, I mean, this is the big elephant in the room, right? Um, there is quite literally, going back to my opening remarks, like we as labor advocates and policy advocates and others are playing a game on a, on a board that is different than what many of these companies are playing. And so it's really important for us to really demand like independent contractors all workers, regardless of their status, should have labor protections, should have access to social protections, should have all that is necessary in the way that we've been talking about um, in order to live fulfilling lives and, and to be able to, to thrive in our economies. And so this, this um, fight that we get drawn into about classification, I'm not saying that's not important at all. What I'm saying though is, there has to be a bigger culture shift and narrative shift alongside the various policies and solutions and bargaining solutions we might come up with that really changes the discussion about independent contractors. There's a false choice that's being put out there in the world, that it's about flex. If you want flexibility, you can't have labor protections. You can't have economic security. You can't have all of the above. And that's not true. That's not true. Mm -hmm. And there's many models. We have many sectors, unionized sectors, where you have the flexibility and you have the job security and dignity on the job in the way that um, people want. And so I think this is, uh, I think there's definitely, uh, we need independent contractor groups, freelancer groups, others to be a part of helping us think through the solutions as we think, you know, as Chris said so aptly earlier, we need a new generation, an updated version of our labor policies to be inclusive of how the, the nature of work has been shifting, but we should not play into this false narrative. And it makes me really nervous when I see policymakers as well as some labor advocates actually uh, play into a narrative that it is a no win for us um, as, as people who care about workers. Joe, can I just add, first of all, let me 100% agree with Sarita. This is a false choice that we are talking about. Yes, um, digital platforms have made it easier to contract for work in different ways. 
But let's also recognize that a lot of what people are considering independent contractors right now are actually employees. We have always had independent contractors. If you go, and I guess people don't use the yellow pages anymore, but let's say you Google an electrician, a plumber, a skilled professional who sets their own hours, decides when they want to work, what they want to do, and that works for themselves. That person is a independent contractor, but the vast majority, well, I shouldn't say many, many of the people that are now considered independent contractors are not doing that level of work. They do not functionally have control over their own workplaces. They functionally don't, obviously don't have protections. They're not earning anywhere close to a, a, a minimum wage in some instances, let alone a livable wage at this point. Recognize that the Affordable Care Act provided some level of protection for them, but that's really just the bare minimum. And so, yes, we need to update our labor laws, which I started, were based on a different economy at the time. But we also, frankly, need to understand that many of these people we're talking about really are employees. And Joe, can I say that globally, this was recognized. That's part of that broken labor market. But in, in 2019, the employers, workers, governments came together at the ILO and we negotiated the Centenary Declaration on the future of work. And it has a very important labour protection flaw framed there. It says, irrespective of employment arrangements, exactly what Chris and Sarita are saying, irrespective of employment arrangements, every worker must have the guarantee of fundamental rights, the right to freedom of association, to organise, to bargain collectively, to be free of discrimination, child and forced labour, plus occupational health and safety, which we're now fighting for, particularly on this day, Workers' Memorial Day, to be part and parcel mm. of uh, fundamental rights. An, an adequate living wage, so an evidence-based minimum living wage on which workers can live with dignity and raise a family, the ILO Constitution, the Philadelphia Declaration, and indeed, of course, the convention itself, and some control over maximum hours of work. That's a labour floor protection that should be in place for all workers. So then things like working hours, flexibility, those are other areas of, of working arrangements that can be negotiated. It's as simple as that. It also says, by the way, that this should be underpinned with universal social protection, again, a standard at the ILO, and indeed a transformative agenda for women and just transition for uh, technology and for climate. You get those things in place with the funding that has been so, indeed, so exposed as, as uh, being an underfunded commitment to our quality public care services. And we've got a package for recovery that means something to people. Thank you uh, for that, Sharon. Um, so we're, we're now into our final 10 minutes of our discussion has just flown by. Um, it seems to me one subject has been alluded to a few times, but we haven't really directly wrestled with it. And that is um, the climate crisis um, and the role it response to it has to play in both preserving um, an econ or creating an economy in which workers' concerns are central and preserving democracy. Um, and I, I wonder how you all view um, that issue uh, in the way that it, that it presents itself to us right now. So that's open for anybody um, who wants to engage in. So if I could, Go to the heart again of trust, because I think this is fundamental. If you're going to build trust for people in democracies, there has to be democracy dividends, things they can see, touch, feel, hold dear, things that give them security. And I must say that globally, you know, you are talking about the exciting, um, you know, progress in the US. Can I tell you, your US administration working with the AFL is really kicking goals for us globally as well. As we try to get solidarity for the 73% the of people who have little or no social protection, so funding for the poorest countries, then the US coalition being built between the government 
and indeed employers and the AFL is so heartening. But it's also about the climate commitment and jobs, bringing those two things together. These are the, when you put people at the centre of economies, then they can see what their leaders are doing for them. And around the world, we see a number of very small democracies, but really robust and trusted democracies. New Zealand, Iceland, Scotland, you know, a, a range, Wales, a range of these countries. And they're all led pretty much by women, can I just say, but nevertheless, who are shifting to, a, to a, an, a, a, an accountability to the people that goes beyond GDP. It's got a term called well-being that's a bit soft for the union movement, but it's absolutely where we need to be, where people's jobs, their livelihoods, their rights, climate action, all of those things that matter to people are reported on because they're part of the budget framing. So democracy is all, has to be all about trust, though. It has to be about trust, mm. but that must be real because people are actually, you know, getting those dividends. I would simply um, add to that and just, you know, highlight the connection between climate change and labor rights. There was an analysis last week that came out that looked at the global impact of climate change by the year 2050. Uh, it was by a, a reinsurance company that estimated that global economic output would be cut by about 14% a year. And that amounts to, I think, something like 23 trillion a year. And it's due to increased uh, disease, lower crop yields, um, coastal cities being consumed by uh, by water, migration, descent, turmoil. Um, we, we talk a lot about the K-shaped economic recovery we have here in the United States. It is not hard to imagine that when we think about the economic consequences of climate change, it will fall disproportionately on the people on the bottom of the K. And, and so, you know, not dealing with climate change uh, is, is going to perpetuate so many of the inequalities we already see right now. Absolutely, and the only other thing I would add in a U.S. context is, um, I know I have at Ford we have joined with other funders who are really looking at the economic recovery and ask and really assessing where the opportunities for job growth are, where deep investments now can make a difference. Speaking to the point that Sharon, you were making. Um, how we build trust and how we have ensure that more people have an experience where their jobs, their livelihoods, their land are all being taken into consideration um, as uh, we're talking about a massive transformation. Um, and so, so all of that to say, I'm hopeful that we can get the right sort of ecosystem together, like not only the advocates, but investors and people in philanthropy who care about these issues and understand the importance of linking these issues alongside policymakers to really um, ensure that we, it's, this is not an abstract conversation, but that we're supporting the modeling of this in cities and states across the country, that's how we will build a kind of momentum on this um, and frankly learn from it, um, from these models of what, what, what needs to be done both to build the trust, but to build the real, um, the kinds of new jobs that we, that Sharon alluded to, that we haven't even allowed our imaginations to embrace at this point, given the polarization of the debate um, over the last decade or so. Well, thank you, Sarita. Um, we're, we're about at the end of time. Uh, I want you to each take one minute before we're done, though, and just share with us something that really makes you feel hopeful in this moment. Uh, and by way of um, laying the groundwork for that, I want to acknowledge a question from David Jacobs that we didn't get to to address, and he asks, how do we leverage our latent power in a mostly hostile federal structure with minoritarian uh, veto points? And, and must our first step be reform of the filibuster? And I would say that for me, one of the things that gives me hope right now is that that's a realistic question in the country now as never before, that we are really confronting this really um, anti-democratic um, device 
which was not in our constitution, which has been blocking so much social progress really over many decades now. And at least we're talking about that and uh, in a way that's educating people and, and, and I think are nearing closer than ever um, addressing that fundamental problem. But let me uh, ask the three of you now um, quickly, what, what gives you hope in this moment? Chair? Sure. So Roy just thanked us all for keeping him positive on the chat. And Roy, uh, wherever you are, then stay positive because you have to believe in the power of people. And I think if we've seen nothing else, you know, we used to describe the uh, age of despair pre-COVID from inequality as an age of anger. But you saw it, women standing up, the, the Black Lives Matter movement, the movement of people, including intergenerational movements for climate. And so I think certainly for us, building workers' power is the thing that keeps us going every day because workers are on the front lines of all these fights for jobs, for rights, for, for wages, and of course, for democracy. So if you believe that people have to build the future, then building workers' power is certainly part of that. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I, I love everything Sharon said. I, I'll qualify one thing. I believe in people, but I really believe in young people. And when I look at the engagement in this country, on social justice, racial justice issues over the last year, um, their their level of an engagement and awareness about climate change, uh, their support, frankly, for labor unions, uh, even though many of them aren't working uh, or haven't gone to the workforce, yes, it's incredible. Um, they're they're coming out to vote. They understand that that this matters. And as somebody who, frankly, grew up in the 70s and 80s and did not see that level of engagement among my peers. It's heartening to see uh, the level of interest of this new generation. Wonderful. Sarita? Um, I am generally a very hopeful person. So I'm with, I'm with you, Sharon and Chris. I, I have a lot of hope in this moment. I think, if anything, this pandemic has really sparked um, a much broader understanding of just where this, where our inequities, uh, the structural challenges um, that result in the kinds of inequities that we face. I mean, it's amazing that in the past year, people are talking about essential workers. They're recognizing low wage workers and low wages, frontline workers. The discourse has changed, which is amazing. And what we do with it is what's important here, or that there's, a, as I said before, a conversation about the care economy. I remember talking about a care infrastructure and care economy not just five years ago and being told we were crazy that we could talk about care across uh, the life spectrum of, 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 a, of a person or a family. Or the fact that, you know, we, you know, I talked about the Alabama Amazon campaign and, and yes, we lost that union election, but boy, I gained a lot of hope from that fight. The hope around the amount of support that people had for these workers, the curiosity and the understanding of what it means to have monopoly power in our economy to workers, Black workers in the South who were making the connection between economic and political democracy here. And so to me, those are all signs of just huge amounts of hope in this moment. And then of course, the movement for black lives and the fight um, mm -hmm. for racial justice. I mean, the discussions about accountability and community safety, these are all kernels. They're all the seeds for the leaps forward that I think um, is, is absolutely possible in this moment. Wow. Well, I, I couldn't imagine a better way to end this session than the, the, the hope that the three of you just shared with us. And what a rich discussion. And thank you all for listening in. And uh, at 2.30, we'll go to our, our concurrent panels, the email that had this link in it will uh, provide links to those. And we hope you join us for those. And I want to thank you, Sharon, Sarita, and Chris, for a really remarkable discussion. We couldn't have started this off any better. And we're deeply indebted to you for being with us and to the really important work all three of you are doing. Uh, we wish you all the best. Thank you all. Thank you.